Hello, this is Daryl Ehrlich with the Billings Gazette, and this is Joseph Luptak, world-famous cellist in the Billings Gazette studio. We're really lucky to have you. Thank you for being here, Joseph, to share your music and your life story. Thanks so much. Thanks okay. for inviting me. Well, it's, it's been a pleasure. So what I want to... You told me something that I want to... Uh, that I want to... Uh, before. Tell me about your cello, because that's not your average... Uh, I played cello in school, and this is not, not it. Well, this is actually a very special instrument, I must say, from our region. It's, a, it's a made by Czech luthier or Czech master. His name uh, was Adam Emanuel Homolka. And uh, I have this instrument for about four years only. I used to play uh, on a different instrument which was built in Vienna before. But this instrument has a very special touch and because it's very rare uh, to have a cello from this uh, master who is named in Czech Republic as a, as a Czech Stradivarius. And he lived in the beginning of uh, 19th century and even end of 18th century, of course. And, uh, and uh, so this was offered to me from a colleague, a cellist from, from Czech Republic. And we had to renovate this instrument to save it for 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 more years because there were there was some work on it really and uh, but i must say that at this time it's uh, it's playing very beautifully and it's in a, in a very good shape it was made in 1842 and uh, and uh, even my friend <laughs> when i told him about the whole this story how i bought it and how it was renovated and how we found uh, and i don't know what's the name of that animal which eats the wood in English, beaver. Beaver. Yes, you know, make a little kind of uh -huh. not not the beaver, the big one, the one which is hidden inside the little. Oh, the little, termite. Yes, yes. So we the 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 the, the guys who were uh, renovating the instrument, restoring the instrument, they found one inside. There is this kind of little stick to support this thing, this corner, and he went out while it was open <laughs> wow <laughs> and and uh, they usually don't stay there because they don't like the sound and vibration so they leave <laughs> but because the instrument was not played for a few years so he probably found a way and he was so much inspired by this by this story that he wrote a book about it <laughs> so now we have a book even for about this cell in slovakia and it's of obviously book for kids and it's about this termite who is traveling from from the from somewhere from the Iceland to the cello, and he's looking for the way how to get out. And he found and about the one guy who bought this cello, and it's it's very interesting. It's very inspiring. What makes and that what, for you? What makes that 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 such a unique instrument as far as how it sounds or plays? Well, first of all, it's it's you know we know. Uh, the most famous Italian or French or German instruments and the Czech instruments are a little bit undervalued in the world and I think the Czech school is very very significant and and there are a number of of uh, luthiers from the history and even from 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 far history which were really uh, had this had, had to learn from Italian masters and which they they saw how it is made and they they made then their own school their own Czech school so I was very happy that that this instrument came to me basically and even it's kind of a smaller size on you know and I'm I'm bigger person so it's kind of a funny for many people and my colleagues of musician that it looks like a viola on me <laughs> but but uh, but actually Surprisingly, because it, even it has a little bit smaller size than usual instrument, it sounds, it projects sounds very beautifully, and it has some special warmth in it, and and it's not just age, but the way he he built it and he made it. Will you play something that demonstrates that for us? Well, yes, of course. Well, I I, I probably would start with the Bach, okay, because that's kind of a base of my repertoire, I must say. So, and you probably all know this first. Prelude by uh, Johann Sebastian Bach for Anacompati Cello, which is so well known and famous. Mm -hmm. 
Other questions? Who wants to ask a question? We're, we're, we've got a room full of journalists. I hope there's someone. <laughs> no questions. No. No. So I'll just... <laughs> I'll, I'll, fine, I'll, I'll keep on asking him. I can do this all day, folks. Can you talk about when you first picked up the cello, how that was for you? Well, I don't exactly remember that, but uh, when we were talking with Daryl also before, that I told him that the, the one who picked... The instrument for me was my mom, and uh, that was my, I think it was a little bit my fate because um, I was the last of four siblings, and uh, and my mom loved cello, and her wish was that one of us will play the cello, so I was last, so I had to do it. <laughs> but uh, there was a, a many good things in it. First of all, that I showed some kind of musical you know, affinity and I, some kind of musical talent. I loved listening, I, I loved listening to music when I was very small and my parents saw that. So she took me to a teacher uh, of a basic artistic school. That was the system we had even until today, which was on the side of a primary school. I was five and I remember that, uh, uh, what I remember from the time that I really liked how the cello looked, but I didn't like to practice on it really because it was really difficult. And I, you know, I I had to practice one or two hours a day. And my friends were playing soccer and and ice hockey, and I I was I had to be home and and practice, you know, and and so they, those were the first years. But I really enjoyed playing the concert. That was my. But always that I, I w wanted to communicate with the people, I wanted to play, but of course that needed to be performed, that, that needed to be practiced before. So I remember that, that the first years were kind of love and hate relationship between me and Cello, but thanks to my first teacher, and she was a really, really great woman, and uh, she learned, she basically, she taught me basically how I should like it, how, how, how I should like the music which is produced by this beautiful instrument. And uh, she was not the, you know, the top teacher of, of the world, but she, this was the base I got from her. And I got basic technique as well, and 
then I could study more. It was really the best I could get, really, for the beginning. So what? Uh, and and you also uh, were listening to, to uh, we we talked about it. You are also hearing some music uh, of your older siblings, Beatles, other things. How does how does a guy who's learning something beautiful like Bach uh, also listen to something like Mo or the Beatles or Cream or Yes? Well, you know I we when my parents told me that I that this is one thing I remember. When I heard playing the, some band at some occasion, I got completely wild, completely crazy. They, they didn't know what's happening to me, but uh, when they played, and it was kind of a Beatles-style group, I remember it until today, and they said I was so excited about it, they, they, <laughs> they didn't know how to calm me down, really, that I was... I. <sighs> I completely absorbed it and I wanted to be there with them on the stage and even not knowing how to play any instrument. I just, I just wanted to be there, really. And uh, <clears throat> so I, I suppose my teacher, my first teacher, because her husband, who already died, was a jazz pianist and very, very well-known jazz pianist in Czechoslovakia. Uh, so he, she had understanding for this. So. Of course, I was playing the classical music pieces, but on the side, she was happy that I did something else as well. But really, truly, I started to do these things when I was in my teenage. So I, I started to do uh, different projects, and, and I was really interested in different kind of uh, music. But this influenced me, really, the beginnings. And it seems like that was something in me that had kind of affection for this kind of music, except the Bach, or Beethoven, or Mozart, or Haydn, of course, and, or Brahms, Shostakovich. But, but I think the Bach was one of the first rock men, really, or jazz men, if I, if I may say so. Right. Can you play us something that, that kind of demonstrates how that, how that kind of something that we would think of more pop music could come across in a cello? Well, I will play you something which, which is more my... <coughs> kind of my own style, which kind of synthesize all of these this, uh, styles, I would say. And this started to be kind of my own uh, music or my, my own compositions in somewhere around year 2000, when I was asked to do a special project based on Bach suites, but uh, in uh, cooperation with contemporary composers. And I got six uh, compositions written for me, and uh, those were uh, so different, all, all influenced by this Bach suite. But they were so different that I was looking for, I was searching how to connect this project, that it will have uh, one kind of face and one kind of line. And I started to experiment with uh, these kind of things, which you will hear, and one of the piece which came out of this was this song without words.
Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Other questions? That, that clicking's unusual. Is that your own creation or is that traditional? It's, it's, uh, it's called the human beatbox, <laughs> basically. <Yeah. laughs> and uh, it's actually quite a big uh, thing now in the music scene. But I'll, I didn't know much about it when I started to do it because I used to play drums as well as a small guy. Uh, as a small boy, I mean, I had 9, 10, 11, and I, I took some lessons from a really great drummer in Slovakia for, for a couple of years. And uh, I realized when I was doing this project, which I described before for this festival, uh, that when I was small, I, I simply sang a song, which I liked, and I did rhythms with it. So it some, somehow came naturally to me because I wanted to be rhythmical. That was always what I liked, really. So uh, to put it together with the cello was just a question of really kind of uh, made this kind of moves and uh, choreography really work because it was not easy to sing and uh, in the beginning for me to sing and do beatbox and play as well and kind of listen to all three instruments basically. And the ba basic idea was to symbolize Bach's uh, composition. Because as you know, you know, he can write music in three, four voices in his fugue, which make perfect sense in linear and vertical sense. So on a cello, okay, we can play maybe some double stops, some chords, but I can't play three separate voices all the time because it's impossible. I have four strings. <laughs> and uh, so this was kind of my my tribute to him, really. <laughs> the way you play seems so open and accessible, and I wonder what reaction you get among children when you play for them. Well, they love it because uh, especially when, when I play uh, this kind of sounds and singing, something new for them. So they expect first, first I introduce cello and cello sound to them sometimes when I do some concerts for, for kids. And, uh, and then I also add this different style and it's, it seems to them it's very, they understand it very well, so they like it really. But of course, you can make lots of sounds on cello, different, not just my voice. And but but uh, nowadays, especially with classical contemporary music, you know, you can go from playing behind the bridge to on the bridge, you know, to the all sorts of uh, harmonics to. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about, you grew up in a system that for most of us, we, we have, whether that was in our own education or even in our thought, w would have been repressive and, and, uh, and in some ways brutal. Your father, your father spent more than 12 months in a, pr uh, a prison in Prague for, for doing no nothing else than being an evangelical Christian. What... How did you learn, uh, how can you be f free and artistic in a society that, mo that, that seems so, to us, brutal? Well, I think it's, uh, it's difficult to say, and I don't know if I have answer to this, really, but uh, I was surrounded by incredible people, really. First of all, my family, and uh, which was not uh, completely you know, paralyzed by the system and still believed in the value, values which are values of freedom. And, uh, and then, you know, through my father, I knew even there was a 50 years difference between us. So it's more than two generations between me and my father. I was born when he was almost 50. Uh, so culturally, sometimes it was not so close as I have, for instance, now my relationship with my father-in-law, who is, who is my really second father, and I can have fantastic relationship with him, and uh, he's my true friend. But, but it was I had great respect be, because he was a personality, which, 
you know, didn't corrupt his back for for fear. I mean, because of the fear with the with the with the system. I mean, you know, and he never thought of himself as a big hero. And I, and uh, he, you know, who would keep his faith uh, confronting the trial to go to the prison? And you don't know if it's going to be just prison. You could really easy, those years, late 50s, you could easy go to Siberia. And, you know, 95% of those people never came back home. So, so I think it was mostly... <clears throat> mostly believe of people that there is something else <laughs> and there is hope, there is freedom and there is possibility uh, behind the curtain, behind the iron curtain. And it's not just that we, we live in a system which is crazy and corrupt and, and stupid, but we can be free inside, first of all, of course. and. Uh, I think this was kind of planted in me somehow, and I'm so grateful to my, first of all, to my parents and and all of friends which were I was surrounded by, and the people which were my basically my life teachers really and and kind of mentors in this way, and the, most of them, they had not they had no easy life during the communism, but after revolution, most of them were involved in a revolution as I was also because I was student and you know there was primarily student movement in in Czechoslovakia together with of course with Václav Havel and all all these people which were in opposition but but we were as a student you know involved in in the in many activities and and uh, we were in a strike uh, board and and it was so exciting so after that, all of these people which I was influenced by, uh, then they, they are so much visible and significant in the society, and they are kind of, a, you know, they are, they are, they are, their voice of values, I would say, at the moment, because I think many people in our society at the moment they are looking backwards, and the freedom is too painful for them. The responsibility or heaviness of responsibility of decisions, of choices. It's something which we didn't know before. And now they have to, now they have to all of it decide by themselves and they have to choose and they have to have a responsible life. So they, some, many of them would like to go back because it was safe in that cage. You had work, you had, you had uh, safety of income, even it was so limited and so poor and so uh, you know, not, not. Uh, it was basically humbling living in that society, be, basically. But they somehow forgot about all of this, what was happening, and they, they, fear and and heaviness of responsibility of living in freedom, is kind of driving them back. Hmm. So at the moment, it's kind of we have democracy, we have freedom. But we need these voices of freedom all the time, <laughs> because even some people in the government, I would say, they are thinking the communistic style. Yeah. Can you share with us a piece, uh, kind of a piece that, that um, you said that, that really, uh, that, that when you were 19, when the revolution happened in 19... Uh, 1989. Uh, yeah, that would have been 89. Can you share with us a piece that meant something to you during that time? Well, uh, I would say it would have to be sung, maybe, because there was a song which was kind of uh, about about believing in truth and love. Uh, and you know, there is this famous sentence which Václav Havel said at the biggest demonstration in Prague, that truth and love has to win over lie and truth and and. and uh, was the opposite of love in English? Hate. Hate against lie and hate, and this kind of sentence went through all the time. And some somebody even, you know, they were complaining when Václav Havel 
started to be very criticized person in Czech and Slovak also society that it's too pathetic but actually I think it's so truthful and the song was by by one journalist actually uh, and and the folk singer Ivan Hoffman and the song was about how how uh, we should still believe even after all those years we lost that belief and that faith that truth has truth matters and love matters as well so we have to refresh this belief and truth uh, belief and faith in this because because that's what valuable and that's what really changes things but i I don't know how to sing this song because he sang the, with very, very special kind of <laughs> expression. But I, I think I would play uh, a Jewish prayer, maybe, because that would be <clears throat> also part of this this uh, result of this uh, revolution. That you know, for instance, in Bratislava there was no uh, rabbi for for 40 years during the during the communism. And of course, communists were not openly against J Jewish people. That was during the war, of course. But we had we had a, we had a Slovak state in uh, from 1939 till end of the war, Second World War, which was collaborating and with Hitler. And uh, I think this is still not resolved in Slovak society. Uh, even we have freedom and democracy, they all think that it was fa it was great place, but they don't see that it was collaboration with Hitler and we sent 72,000 Jews to concentration camps and they were basically wiped out from our country. And I know people <laughs> which are, which were during the, which were uh, present during the revolution, which were born in concentration camps. And they were, they are still there, and they can testimony that, you know. So I would play this in a, as a, you know, as a, as a one of my, as we were talking before, one of my projects is of these Hasidic songs. But this is Jewish prayer by American, Swiss, Jewish composer Ernest Bloch, and I, I love this piece very much. And uh, it's I always played when I I talk about the history of our Slovak Republic that this is something we have to remember that we have to say sorry to our Jewish friends which were sent out and uh, and that we have to deal with this history somehow so and it's a part of I think it's a part of cle clearing up these things after the revolution so this is Jewish prayer by. Ernest Bloch.
I'm a former woodwind player, so it's all about breath with me, and I've noticed you um, taking breath along with your music. And I'm wondering if that's a, a conscious choice or if that's unconscious. Well, it's completely conscious because, I mean, the same way as a, a singer is singing and the woodwind player, uh, would have been player is playing with the breath. I have to do it the same way, and that's part of the studies I had was was dealing with the breath, how to breathe. Some of the uh, instrumentalists kind of undervalue this, but it's very important because the ho whole your body, of course, the same way as when you play, I don't know, oboe or flute or whatever, or when you sing has to be very relaxed and part of it is breathing, of course. So I, I have to know when I'm breathing and when I'm not. And therefore, you know, it's part of the, the whole playing and it's basically part of the system of technique, really, breathing. <laughs> Other questions? When, uh, when you were listening to Western pop music, was that before the breakup? How did you get pop music to... Well, well, it was more rock than pop, I would say. Well, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, but yes, I understand what you mean. It's a, it's a, well, many people, <laughs> it was very di different ways. First of all, we had, a, we were lucky that we were close to Austrian borders. So even they were trying to block the signal we still had some radio. Then we had Radio Free Europe, for instance, which was, you know, we certain hours you could listen to, to true news <laughs> because our, our news were corrupt, basically. I think, I think it's similarly happening in certain similar ways in Russia at the moment as, as well, I, or China maybe. And, uh, and uh, so they were also, you know, sending some, we had some, some news about the music, what's going on. But, but uh, people, some people, you know, could travel. I mean, I, I was even with the school orchestra, we were in Germany, for instance. But it was, it was not so easy because always when you were entering the Western country, so you had to have three permissions. One was from the police, it was the main one. So that was the first permission you were asking the police for permission to leave the country. And you got some, we call it doloshka. And we, it was a paper, basically you could wait one month, you could wait five months for that permission. But usually it was one to three months until you got it. Then you, we needed a visa, of course, which was easy because countries, they, they usually gave you the visa, entering visa. And then you had to have allowance of foreign currency, which was given to you by bank, because we didn't have enough, you know, Western money. And uh, so you had to buy some money to go out. <laughs> that, that, that there were some allowance per day. But of course, everybody had something else in the pocket from the black market as well. But uh, so these three things you had, to, you had to do. And then, of course, many people were traveling for di various reasons, arts, sports, <clears throat> other things, conferences. It was still happening, of course, but you always had to have these, these permissions. When we were traveling as students from conservatory, for instance, we had a concert in Bayreuth, in very famous Wagner city, and we were there for three weeks to, to, to study and to play. We always had to have somebody with us to watch us. And that was very interesting. We, we all knew he's a guy from Secret Police, but he was officially doctor, for instance. <laughs> and, uh, and there was always somebody we, don't, we didn't know but he was watching what we are doing. And if you were meeting somebody suspicious, so he, he, he would send a report, and then you went for an interview after you came back home. Yeah, you, you had a relative who played jazz. Your grandfather? 
uh, no, no, my uncle was my uncle was a violinist, but he he didn't play jazz, but more kind of folk oh. music, and he was teacher of violin in North Slovakia, but he died during the Second World War as a as a activist in a in a Slovak uh, national uprising, which was against the Germans. And so it was the last day of the war, actually. Very. <laughs> and uh, so I have a name after him. <laughs> he was named Josef as well as me. Tell so, so yes, yeah, so, th so this was the way how they brought the music, basically. Yes. LPs, LPs. Exactly. Yes, yes. And also some later in 80s, they started to also publish. But of course, you know, one year later, when Gen I, I remember I had bought LP of Pink Floyd and Genesis and ES in Bratislava. But it was like they would publish several thousand pieces and it was immediately out. Oh, okay. You know, so. Tell me a little, uh, will you tell about uh, when we talked earlier, you talked about how the con even the concerts had to be approved. <laughs> will you tell us about that? That's, that's fascinating. Well, in classical music, it was, uh, the classical music was always kind of uh, the same way as in Russia. It was kind of a window to be proud of because we had very good schools, singers and instrumentalists and it was very much influenced by Russians. But, uh, you know, it was never, you could never hear uh, in Slovak Philharmonie, for instance, uh, Handel Messiah or Mozart Requiem. It was only after the revolution. Only very special occasions because it had religious content. So when they didn't like it and but on the contrary, classical musicians were the ones which were actually living fairly comfortably because it was something we were proud of. So there were only these two. Only if you were kind of you know, controversial person which were too open and was speaking either against the regime or had uh, too much bourgeois history in your family or something like that. So then you were suspicious and, and you, your career was blocked, basically. Uh, in the rock music, in the rock music scene, it was much more complicated because, because it was kind of a picture and sign of imperialism and capitalism. This, this rock music is something we don't want in our healthy communism. And uh, we don't want this influence. And, uh, so if there were groups like this, okay, you had to go to a special, each town had some culture house and they were reporting to some, some board. It was a very complicated system actually, which you know, you could some, somehow sometimes sneak in and get out of it. But usually you had to, if you wanted uh, approval for a concert, you had to go and send what's your words the words had to be controlled, if it's okay. And then you had to play in front of some committee which allowed you to play the concerts. And then when you played the concerts, then every concert had to be reported to the officials. And every year you had to do this kind of exams again and again. But on, on, on the other side, the groups had to find a way how to <laughs> how to hide the content in the words, like the same way as I, I told you, Shostakovich was hiding in a Russia, or Soviet Union rather, not the Russia, but in the Soviet Union, the, the kind of hidden protests against the, the system. And, and he was basically laughing of this, which they couldn't read it in that, but he was such a brilliant composer that he would hide the love of the system and and they would still hire him at some time <laughs> because he was a fantastic composer <laughs> and uh, actually it was against them really it was a protest songs and uh, and uh, it was the same with with the rock groups or folk so singers uh, or or even some jazz musicians but that was not so complicated Words were all, always the problem. So, and they, even theaters actually, theaters was, was another thing. And, uh, and uh, they, they would basically hide the content within the words and we learned how to read it. So we kind of 
we knew the double meaning there. What was it? And of course, they were they were not stupid. Some of them they knew what is it going on, but they couldn't they couldn't prove it that this is wrong, <laughs> and they couldn't stop it. So. So some groups were really like, uh, for us, like a window to freedom, like a fresh air. So therefore, this was like, uh, some of them, they had real troubles. I mean, they would stop them for five years and they couldn't play and they thought they will be not playing anymore. And, uh, and the art scene was really kind of, a, kind of a protest song, really, against that. Yeah. I'm eager for you to play something rock influenced. <laughs> yeah. Me? Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I can. <laughs> I I usually need some friends with me to do that. <laughs> You're among friends. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean music, musical oh, friends. Sorry, but yeah. uh, but uh, <laughs> I can try a little sample. a little bit about uh, you, we talked a little bit about Roma or gypsy music and, and your work with that and you talked a little bit about that's also you know you've talked a little bit about what what's Slovak what's what's home yeah uh, and a reflection talk a little bit about that and can you share with us some music that we may not that may not be familiar to us yes. or maybe it is with, yeah with we'll see <laughs> we'll <Yeah>. see <laughs> uh, well well this is two projects which uh, they were they were I came to them because Again, because of the friends and because of some recognition as well as a as a musician, but also as a person which I I care about our society really actively, and uh, uh, and my friend who was uh, uh, she's an ethnologist and ethnographer and works with gypsies for many many years goes to the you know poor villages in East Slovakia and collect is collecting the songs the same way as Bela Bartok, the Hungarian uh, composer, collected Slovak, Hungarian, Romanian, Transylvanian songs and then influenced all his work and compositions. And of course, gypsy music was always inspiration to the classical musicians, to world music musicians, and, and from Haydn to Brahms to whoever, Bartok. And, uh, and uh, part of this, this uh, I, I was happy to accept this offer to work with gypsy musicians. That was her idea, basically, because she found some true gypsy singers which knew old, authentic gypsy songs. Like nowadays, we, what we really know is this kind of Roma pop. And that's not true gypsy songs from the from the past, and she found a few singers uh, which truly still, still were singing this and, and knew these old songs. And uh, so she, she set up this project and uh, to cooperate with the professional musicians. So we met with them. It was quite an experience, I must say, because they are different. They are different, but they are the, pe the same people as we are. But 
but they have different traditions. They have different living standard. They, but when you start playing with the music, it's like the the soulmates really, and they they sing and they live the music so uh, so strongly in a moment they do it like they live in the present time that you can I first time I I heard the singer Bella he was he was our kind of main singer of the group I had shivers I, I was shaking because it was so powerful and then I played for him some Bach I played for him some Jewish songs I played for him and then we were friends immediately and so that was part of it is that Slovak society is really xenophobic or xenophobic too towards towards gypsies and they, they don't don't like them really because they are different because they are they smell differently they they are dirty and they sometimes they steal and and uh, but it's not all of them it's just some of them and uh, and we this was our attempt, very small attempt, to integrate them to the society with the best of what they can do. Because music is their treasure, basically. And the reactions of the audience in Slovakia, in Czech Republic, and in, in foreign countries were absolutely amazing. Even, you know, it was very difficult to work with them because they they forgot how was the structure of the song we prepared. They are not educated. Uh, they they <laughs> forgot what we are doing sometimes. We had to follow them. But the power of their expression was so strong. And the connection between the professional musicians which are trained and we are them with them and we are basically supporting them. We are bringing them on a platform which they are important, not us. So people were just crazy about it. And we, you know, two years, one by one, we got a kind of prize for this, uh, for this project. We recorded a CD, we recorded a, a, a document film uh, about how we did the project uh, from, from kind of an academy of, of, of people in a, in, a, in a newspaper in Slovakia as a project of the year. And uh, then we cooperated with one pop singer. She was she was really interested in that with Jana Kirchner, and and uh, so it was not just it was artistic project primarily, and creating this special music of old ancient gypsy songs. But uh, that's for is called it is called after Purikane Purikane Gila, that means old ancient song in gypsy gypsy language and that was our first project which was just like a trial and then we created this band of six singers and three musicians uh, and we had even one one uh, one uh, black drummer there Thierry and uh, so it was truly world music band and uh, uh, so uh, so this was kind of underline to bring to the people in Slovakia a more positive picture about gypsies, that they are actually valuable people. They are the same as we are. They are. They have just different, different culture, different traditions, but they are part of our society. We can't separate them. We can't kick them out. And this was similarly to this when Rabbi Baruch Myers which was first rabbi, which he is, not was, is first rabbi after the communism in Bratislava, uh, came to me and offered me this project of Hasidic songs. So I was very honored and happy that, uh, that, that we could start searching for old songs which were influenced by cultures of, and music from Hungary, from, from Russia, from uh, Ukraine, Poland, Slovakia and which were part of Hasidism for 400 years. And, uh, and uh, because it's, again, it's kind of hidden anti-Semitism in our society. It's not open. 
but it's still there because we didn't deal with our history properly. And of course, with my friends, it's clear to us that Jewish people are, are part of our culture, our society. They were creating our, our you know, history. But when you go out and uh, ask people what they think about Jewish people, okay, so they blame for everything, them, or gypsies, or now the refugees are the problem, and the Muslims. And so this kind of closeness and xenophobic feeling is very strong now. So I don't know, maybe I have to have another project about refugees. <laughs> with the Syrian pro with the Syrian music or whatever, <laughs> but but uh, but so this was, and Hasidic songs were is purely artistic project and it's kind of new approach to Hasidic songs, and I think I think it's a great project and we would love to bring that here hopefully in near future, and uh, uh, but this is the underline that I think it's it's important. To, 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 to speak out this, that look, this is a part of our history, part of our society. So, so maybe I can play for you a, a gypsy anthem. Yeah, will you do that? We yeah. just have a few minutes left, and I'd love to do that. Yeah, I want to hear that. <clears throat> so this is called Jelem Jelem, and it's, ta it's understood as a old ancient gypsy anthem. I want to say thank you so much for giving your time and most of all thank you for giving your music to thank us you. uh you spend you spend a lot of time and and your story is has been inspiring i want to thank uh, bill also for for helping arrange this this has been a great time joseph thank you so much thank you this has been thank a project you. of the billings gazette thank you so much <laughs>